Well, welcome everybody. This is Dr. Michael K from the Center for Functional Health, and I am honored to have Dr. Vinny Leonti with me today. Dr. Vinny, thank you very much for coming on and sharing with us your knowledge. We are living in some crazy times right now. This is looks like and reading like it is a novel, uh, a book of fiction, yet this is nonfiction. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you can share today. Again, our goal is to lend some calm to everybody that's out there. And at the same time, I want to hear about your backstory, um, how you got involved in what you're doing, and we can move forward from there. How's that sound? Sounds great. Excellent. So if you can give us your educational background, you're a medical doctor, where you went to school and all that. Okay. Um, did my college uh, at the University of Rochester in New York, and then medical school at Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse. Um, went from there, did my residency in family medicine at um, United Health Services in Binghamton. Um, so all in upstate New York. And uh, then I spent primarily my time uh, um, about 28 years uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, 24 years in the emergency room and then uh, another eight years doing conventional family medicine. Uh, and then um, launched into my current integrative and functional uh, medicine practice about three, three and a half years ago now. So. so going from basically one could say a traditional setting into this integrative model, correct? Correct. Um, how, how was that received by your colleagues when you said, hey, listen, I'm going to kind of do this kind of work? Yeah, I think most people were supportive though i don't think they really understood what i was doing so um you know it was uh yeah i think a lot of people just don't really understand the models so it was just like oh Vinny's going off and doing something else so <laughs> I, I know when i work i work with a neurologist and when he had the meeting with the hospital and said he is going to leave hospital, he's not going to come in for rounds anymore, and he's going to deal just basically with chronic pain. They looked at him like he was just bonkers. You know, how, mm -hmm. how dare you, you know, buck the system? Um, right. So I know sometimes it's very hard for you guys to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to do something that's different, you know? Um, but I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of great passion behind what you do. You get to spend your time with your patients now. Right, absolutely. And for me, maybe it was made easier because not only did I leave my former job, but I actually moved entirely out of the area because I was in upstate New York. So it was just a totally clean break, which is sometimes easier probably than what your, you know, the neurologist did where he's kind of staying in the same area, but just not going to the hospital. So, right. Um, but yeah, I get to spend a lot more time with patients and uh, look at things, you know, through a different lens, a much more powerful lens, if you will, to uh, cr help create health rather than just kind of uh, manage chronic illness. So, um. so the, the typical patient that comes to you, I mean, are they seeing you as their primary care doc? Or are they seeing you for, um, you know, I know you have the medical marijuana program. So what is your typical patient that you see? Hmm. Not even sure that there is a typical patient. Um, okay. There's been probably, <laughs> or maybe typical groups, if you will. There are some um, patients who um, have kind of that con complex chronic illness, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, autoimmune diseases um, that lends itself more to a functional approach uh, rather than, um, you know, more of the conventional medicine and they've been a lot of those people have been through kind of the the, the mill of uh specialists if you will um you know they've seen oftentimes three four five six specialists and haven't gotten answers to their problems so we'll we'll get those people um to work with um then there are the people who are coming to me who maybe are somewhat more conventional in terms of uh, they're coming to me because I have a particular um, passion, excitement about uh, taking care of vas people with vascular risk factors, preventing uh, heart attacks and strokes, and helping with the cardiometabolic syndromes. So those folks are a little bit more conventional, just getting the uh, benefit of more of looking at the root cause and, you know, 
waking them up to the idea that you can actually reverse your illness rather than just uh, kind of taking a pill or moving on to insulin, that kind of thing. Um, so there's that group. And then there's, as you mentioned, the group for medicinal marijuana and those uh, folks um, are more coming to me just because they either have problems with chronic anxiety or chronic pain. Um, and I'm more just managing, you know, uh, certifying them for medicinal marijuana and helping to manage uh, them in that fashion. Those people often have their own primary care doctors that they're still seeing, uh, maybe even pain specialists. Folks who uh, are either coming to me for their vascular risk factors or for their autoimmune, they may choose our practice as their primary care practice. And I would say about, probably get about half and half. Half of them uh, will keep a primary care doctor, the other half will start using us as their primary care, so. Um, now I want to talk about cardiovascular, but before we move on to that, my question is, you know, have you found good outcomes using medical cannabis for those with autoimmune? I mean, the fibro patients do very well with it. Are you using that for autoimmune as well? I'm curious. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is it depends on where the patient is on that spectrum. I really haven't been uh, targeting the autoimmune patients with, for that. Um, more likely to go to low dose naltrexone and CBD first. Um, certainly if they have a painful condition, as you said, with fibromyalgia and that kind of thing, I think cannabis is supremely helpful. But for actually using it to reverse autoimmune disease, I haven't really ventured out into that particular territory as of yet. Gotcha. Okay. So we do have a question from one of our attendees, and we'll, this will give me a great segue into cardiovascular. Is, do you support a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet for cardio patients? Uh, often depends on the patient. I certainly support a uh, lower carbohydrate diet for almost all patients. There is so much cardiometabolic disease here that, yes, certainly a low um, um, carbohydrate. And it depends on the fat. I mean, I, I am not limiting fat in my patients, um, but I want that. I certainly want those to be good fats. I want those to be the olive oils. I want those to be, uh, you know, nuts. I want those to be avocados. Um, I'm not so keen if they're trying, if they're going out and eating steak every night, that's probably not something I'm going to support. Um, so, um, but certainly the, the good fats, but an occasional, uh, you know, grass fed, uh, um, you know, organic type of uh, steak is, I certainly think is for most people is fine. Um, but I'm not specifically looking at a specific amount of fat, but uh, what I'm looking for is uh, a lower carbohydrate and seeing, uh, you know, those people will go more towards uh, fat. I'm not looking for a lot of high protein either. So um, certainly good fats, I think are great. Actually. So before we start going down the road of statins and stuff like that, why don't you share your story about your cardiovascular event that, you know, got you moving kind of, I guess, I guess this is that event that kind of got you moved in that direction, you think, or? Um, actually, I, I uh, you know, it, it got me wondering anyway. So yeah, let me tell my story. Um, you know, so I was, uh, um, you know, I was an ER doctor, as I mentioned. I was also, uh, you know, I, I, I liked exercise. I uh, was a runner. I run four marathons. Um, you know, so um, I was surprised when I was out for just one of my routine three mile runs uh, when I was 57 years old and uh, developed kind of a, uh, a squeezing chest pain. Um, didn't really want to believe that that was angina, uh, but I, I noticed that when I ran, it hurt, and when I walked, it didn't hurt anymore. Um, so I went and uh, um, saw the cardiologist, had a stress test, which I gloriously flunked, um, had a cardiac cath the next day, and I had an 80% blockage in one coronary artery and a 70% in uh, another, and I woke up with two stents. Uh, so that was surprising to me. Um, and really, it's taken me, even doing what I'm doing, it kind of uh, taken me these past seven years. I start, really started doing integrated and functional medicine about three years ago. But I still always wondered 
why I had, uh, you know, why I developed coronary artery disease. My dad had coronary artery disease. That he had a heart attack at the age of 47, but he smoked Lucky Strikes. He was 60 pounds overweight. So I didn't have either of those particular risk factors. So I thought that I was going to be immune from coronary artery disease. Um, but I did have some, of, you know, some other risk factors, certainly with working in the ER, uh, being on the front lines, if you will. Um, you know, high stress job. Um, kind of disrupted sleep during that time period. Um, those were some of the risk factors I, you know, certainly contributed. Um, and it turns out that I um, finally figured out that I have um, an inherited uh, risk factor, a lipoprotein disorder that I must have gotten from my dad because my mom lived to 92 without heart disease. So um, that was not tested for by any cardiologists, um, only tested by my own integrative physician. Um, so I think that put, uh, you know, kind of one of the final uh, pieces in place for me. So yeah, so I became after this, you know, with my heart disease and realizing there was a uh, um, different way. I did cardio, I went to the Institute of Functional Medicine, took their cardio metabolic, that was my first module. And when I saw the power there, you know, it really did um, make me see that there was a different way of doing things and that I could help people in a much different and much more powerful fashion than I could by using conventional medicine and conventional risk factors and that kind of thing. So um, I can tell you that, you know, I work with, I should say cardiologists are in my area where I work, right? They're across the way. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't even know like this side exists from an integrative perspective whatsoever. Yeah. You know, we, I want to talk about lab testing and I can tell you that simple things like when I say, Hey, did you guys run an LDLP? They look at me like, why, why would I even do that? I'm going to give them a statin anyway. I'm like, you know, LabCorp has this NMR profile. It's, that's incredible. But like, what a waste. We're just mm -hmm. going to give them the statin anyway. So let's jump into, if we can, Lab work, your feelings on lab work, the, the importance of LDLP, if you feel that's important, and statins. Yeah, sure. Um, so typical lab work uh, that I do on um, all my uh, vascular risk factor patients, and all, any patient who actually is, uh, you know, maybe over the age of uh, 40 that might have some, something inflammatory going on, I check an expanded panel of inflammatory markers, um, that tell us about, that, you know, give us an idea whether there could be inflammation coming from the mouth, the oral microbiome, if you will. Um, you know, markers that say if there is inflammation in the arteries, uh, um, you know, and checking uh, microalbumin to see if the kidneys are start, starting to leak from inflammation. Um, so we do those inflammatory markers. And then we uh, do that, as you said, that NMR lipoprofile, which is looking at not just the standard, uh, you know, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and uh, triglycerides, but looks at the actual particle numbers. And yes, I do think those are very important because, you know, you can have what looks like uh, a somewhat high LDL, but when you actually look at the particle numbers, you can see that those are, those particles are actually of a larger size, less likely to be inflammatory, less likely to damage blood vessels. Um, and so that person, you might not rush to give a statin. You might do some lifestyle modifications and, uh, um, you know, get, you know, put them on that low carbohydrate um, diet um, and see, see what happens with their numbers rather than just rushing to a statin. Um, you know, I try to avoid statins in, you know, the majority of my patients. Do I say that I never use them? I, I would never say that. I think there are certain people um, who have high inflammatory markers. And we also do um, a test called... Uh, CIMT, which stands for carotid intimal medial thickness, um, which actually lets us look at their blood vessel wall and see if there's inflammation and plaque and how much of that there is. And if there's a lot of that, um, and 
you know, you can sort of, you can get an idea whether they actually might have some uh, early event risk, as they say, that they might be uh, more prone to have an event in the next three to five years. I might use a statin temporarily because it is very powerful at getting things down. And um, well, we kind of put all the lifestyle and, and things into play. Um, but that is the minority of the patients, the majority of patients, I would say that I don't use statins and will use uh, lifestyle um, and, uh, you know, botanical supplements to quell inflammation, get their LDL and HDLs better um, and, and attack it from that way along with the lifestyle, you know, the lifestyle and making sure all those uh, uh, everything we can, optimize everything we can, the activity, the sleep, all that, um, testing for sleep apnea, testing their oral microbiome to see if there's uh, high risk bacteria in the mouth, um, you know, doing all of that. Um, and that is much more powerful than just looking at the cholesterol and putting them on a statin, obviously. Right. And that, that happens as a norm. Um, right. So what does that conversation sound like if you do have that conversation of, you know, here you're seeing your patient, it comes from maybe a cardiologist or another doc, you do run the NMR lipid profile, you do say, hey, this is kind of crazy here. Um, you know, why don't we have you come off of a stat and then try this lifestyle change? How is that, how is that accepted? Uh, I'll have to say that I would say the vast majority of people who come to my office uh, seem to be in the group that wants to come off statins. So, okay. So there's, there's some motivation to begin with. So it makes it have a lot easier. Yeah, That's absolutely. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So we got another question here. Can the MI, myocardial infarction, uh, cause lipids to change after the event? Do you think that? So can an MI cause lipids to change after an event? Huh. Um, I've, I think it usually lipids changing is more a function of a, the diet in my experience. I haven't, um, I haven't noticed post MI that, um, you know, built just the MI itself will cause it. But usually what happens after an MI is uh, I would say about 99.9% .9 of people come out on a stat. So, um, so I would say certainly the statins will change the lipids. I'm not sure which way we're talking about the lipids going, if the lipids are going up, down, or down. Um, but certainly usually after an MI, there's a statin involved and that will usually um, make it lower. Um, and certainly dietary changes can have a huge impact if uh, people change uh, how they're eating. And most, most people do after they have an MI, usually pretty motivating for people. Um, so if there's, if there's more detail on that, I can comment on that more right. for sure. So can, can you briefly discuss about apolipoprotein A and B? Sure. So, um, Apolipoprotein A is an apolipoprotein that is on the HDL particle, um, and apolipoprotein B is on the LDL particle. And that usually gives us a better idea, you know, it sort of correlates with particle number, if you will, because there's one apolipoprotein A on um, each HDL particle and one apolipoprotein B on, L on each LDL particle. And it's the ratio of those two things that will uh, help you determine if somebody is at higher or lower risk. The, uh, the higher the ApoB in relation to the ApoA, uh, um, the higher the risk is. Gotcha. So when you put somebody in your protocol, I mean, we've seen this in, in our office, you know, we you know, rerun the blood work and we see improvement. Mm -hmm. So how many months, weeks do you like to see after you put somebody on a statin to rerun it to see how they're doing or an integrative approach with, without a statin or, com or a combo? Yeah. So I like to recheck labs at like uh, three months usually. Okay. Um, and often that's when the insurance companies like to pay for them. So that kind of right. correlates pretty well. <laughs> It just, it just so happens. It just so happens. I mean, I think you can actually see changes in, in lipids uh, 
you know, I've seen changes within a month, actually. Um, so you can see them that quickly. I, I tend not to do it that frequently just because the insur you know, insurance companies don't like right. to pay for it. Right. So. I think the lifestyle plays such a large role, you know, from nutrition to sleep to exercise. So I want to talk about exercise a little bit. You know, we have these people that over-exercise, which is not healthy for them. Uh, we know that there have been uh, articles out there with those who do long-distance running marathons have AFib. Um, so what is your take on exercise? Yeah, so I might have been an over-exerciser, right? I told you I ran four marathons. I did that over the course of uh, probably a few decades anyway. It wasn't like I ran a marathon every year, but certainly I, I wonder if I did put my body under more physiologic stress than I uh, should have. Um, so yeah, I think you can overexercise. I think you can uh, that can result in uh, elevated cortisols and insulin resistance and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I go by the guide. You know, I think the guidelines of uh, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, aerobic exercise every week. You know, uh, which would be considered uh, jogging or running. You know. And, Certainly not. Uh, I, I wouldn't think that the people who are, uh, you know, not the elite runners who are, you know, in, are in racing form. Those that's more high intensity exercise. But I think for most people, who are moderate, you know, um, moderate intensity, uh, um, those, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten minute miles, probably more moderate intensity. Um, I think when once you start getting down to the six minute, five minute, four minute miles, I think probably those are high intensity exercises. Yeah, there, there, there's so. a, there's a high intensity. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love the jump rope. I think the jump rope is probably one of the most efficient piece of cardio equipment uh, that one can use. I mean, and it's not like you're going to be jumping rope for like 15, 20 minutes either. Right. 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 It's very yeah. very efficient. Yeah, you know. absolutely. And uh, so when they say 300 minutes of moderate intensity. Um, and actually, you know, fast walk is also in the moderate intensity. So, but something like jump roping or actually, so the running it would actually, uh, you usually get about double the minutes in, in terms of, so if you walked for say 150 minutes, running for 75 minutes would be considered somewhat equivalent to that. And jump roping, you know, is probably even, is, is certainly more probably gets into the higher intensity category than, uh, than running, you know, does. Um, so doing that. Um, and easier on the joints too, right? So right. if you know how to jump rope properly, it's just so much easier on the joints. I mean, you're really preserving your, your ankles, your knees, your hips. So it's just, it's a wonderful movement pattern. I'll, I'll have to have you teach me how to jump rope, Michael, because I can't uh, can't seem to coordinate that for some reason. Yeah, I mean, when I was taught that back in chiropractic college, it was like, wow, you know, a whole world just you know opened up. It's like I don't have to run for two hours and still getting some wonderful cardio work. Yeah. You know? So it's 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 really uh, an excellent activity. Mm -hmm. So before we get on to the the current news of the day, which is you know really related to what we're talking about, um, your last thought on you know, should I go carnivore? Should I go vegan? Should I become a vegetarian? You know, I mean, I get this question quite a bit in the office. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that? And people who go all carnivore diet, I mean, some of my gut patients have done incredibly well with that. Um, so we usually do some base testing as well, but what are your thoughts on that? Like that all carnivore diet? Yeah. Um, so you're saying people are not taking in any plant products at all? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know. Maybe because I'm Italian, um, you know, I am, uh, you know, certainly partial to the Mediterranean type diet, which is a lot of uh, fresh vegetables and fresh fruit and uh, lower on the meat and, um, you know, lower, you know, fresh fish. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence that the Mediterranean diet is a very heart healthy diet. Um, to be honest, I haven't seen the evidence on the, on the old carnivore diet in terms of heart health. Um, certainly, I think that an all carnivore diet, as you said, could be very healing for the gut and that kind of thing. You know, so it, you know, certainly has its uses there. I'm just not sure over the long term um, how it would be. Certainly, I, I know that um, diets, if you're all carnivore and you're not 
taking in, you know, if you're not taking in carbohydrates and that kind of thing, I guess that would, um, you know, take care of a lot of the carbohydrates that people uh, um, would be taking in. Certainly, I guess there are groups like the Eskimos who uh, eat a lot of what they eat a lot of, I assume, whale and seal and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, high fat. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know those statistics. So now, now I'm going to have to look that up and uh, yeah, I can, uh, you know, see see what people uh you know see what the evidence is out there about those kind of diets and then heart health so let's let's jump on to today's current events i mean we we'd be remiss not to talk about you know covid19 um and it seems like those who are at risk aside from elderly are those who have cardiovascular mm -hmm. uh, yeah. risk um those who have diabetes you know we can talk about this underlying inflammation so from your perspective, you know, somebody reads the news and they say, oh, my God, I do have a heart condition. Um, and they're now worried. So how, how, how do they begin? What, do you, what is your suggestion for the first thing for them to start? It's like, I got to get heart healthy. Yeah, I mean, um, well, the first thing to do is to, you know, do your best to avoid having to getting exposed to COVID-19, obviously. Um, you know, but I think that, you know, people, and this is what we've been suggesting to our patients, that they should get healthier. They should do all the lifestyle things uh, that need to be done that they may have been putting off. They should be, you know, sleeping more, getting better rest. They should, um, well, maintaining social distancing should be doing activity uh, to keep their bodies moving. Um, they should, uh, you know, be eating, um, a good clean diet, avoiding the sugars and the carbohydrates, uh, um, and then, you know, um, if they have a heart condition, then, you know, there are usually supplements that we recommend that can help improve heart health, uh, you know, making sure that they have adequate vitamin D, making sure that they are, uh, they have a heart condition that they're um, taking some fish oil. I usually recommend fish oil for my patients, good quality fish oil, um, certain antioxidants, uh, um, quercetin, curcumin, um, those kind of things, lycopene, um, to optimize uh, the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant capacity of their body to deal with things in, in case uh, something does happen. Um, I mean, I saw, I saw a report yesterday as, as I was scanning through that um, COVID-19 itself can cause some uh, heart injury so um, in a certain minority of people. So probably explains why people with cardiovascular disease are at higher risk. So, you know, getting yourself as healthy as possible, doing all the things you need to do, I think minimizes that risk uh, um, for people. So, right. And it's not too late, right? I mean, it's not, it, it, you can start anytime. Now would be a great time to start. Um, it's interesting. I, we find ourselves doing stuff that, you know, we tell our patients to do that by default it's happening. Um, myself, I'm sleeping more than I usually sleep. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's happening on your end or not, yeah. but sleep is, is really important. So could you talk briefly regarding, um, sleep and cardiovascular health and your take on melatonin? So, um, yeah, so sleep is very important for cardiovascular health. Um, it is when we are sleeping that we get truly parasympathetic. Our body goes into uh, healing mode. Um, helps quell, calm down inflammation, that kind of thing. And there are certainly a slew of scientific studies that people sleep less than six hours a day uh, that, um, that is not good for your longevity. Um, so I would recommend that people certainly sleep more than six. And I usually try to tell people sleep seven to eight hours a night, um, you know, for best effects. Um, so I want to take on melatonin. So melatonin has many properties. Um, you know, certainly for some people, it helps them sleep. Um, it also helps uh, actually with acid reflux. Uh, 
um, and uh, it also works as an antioxidant and an anti-cortisol. So I think uh, melatonin can be helpful for people, especially with sleep problems, but also people who uh, might want to, uh, you know, might have some uh, insulin resistance, cortisol, that kind of thing can also be helpful there. Excellent. And we have another question. Um, can exercise slow down atherosclerosis? What is your opinion on that? Can exercise slow down atherosclerosis? It certainly can. It's certainly uh, one of the recommended interventions um, uh, helps. You know, when you exercise, you generate uh, many anti-inflammatory compounds. So that's one way it does it. The other way it does it is, uh, especially in people with cardiometabolic syndrome, is that it improves insulin sensitivity. It actually takes glucose right out of the uh, bloodstream and into the muscles without the need for insulin. So um, helps control blood sugar in that way. So it has a many uh, beneficial effects in terms of atherosclerosis. Excellent. So in, in winding up, what last tips, recommendations would you give that person um, to improve their optimum health, to improve their cardiovascular health, to keep them you know, as, as safe as they can from COVID-19 and how to move forward. Okay. So um, again, uh, you know, while maintaining all uh, appropriate social distancing, being active, sleeping well, eating um, a good diet. In my mind, that's uh, a high phytonutrient diet uh, minimal amounts of red meat, high fish, um, you know, uh, let's see, what else uh, have I been doing to help people? Irrigating with uh, hypertonic saline, there's uh, um, something on our, we came across an article um, that hypertonic saline, nasal irrigation, uh, the chloride in there actually helps your uh, own cells make its own endogenous hypochlorous acid, which is the active ingredient in bleach. And they, it has been shown to be active against coronaviruses. There's a study from last year, it was active against a coronavirus that caused the flu. Um, it wasn't tested against COVID-19 because that wasn't uh, known about doesn't. then. Right, so um, couldn't be tested against that, but it is, uh, it has a broad antiviral activity. So we can, uh, I can share that with, uh, with you uh, later, Michael. And you can that share that would your... be great. So you're saying this is a preventative measure? This is a preventative measure. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Actually, if you could share that, it'd be great. Cause I like to share it with, you know, the people on Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Yep, I've started using hypertonic saline before I go out of the house, when I come back, uh, um, you know, and uh, yeah, it, there, there are studies that it actually uh, showed that it shortened durations of people's colds and that kind of thing. So uh, the idea is hopefully that it will, um, even if it doesn't totally prevent it, that it will uh, knock down the numbers of coronavirus and, um, you know, make it a less severe case. So interesting that's yeah a, that's a great share thank you for that yeah um you're welcome yeah thanks for let me think of all my tips let's see yeah that's really good um <laughs> uh, what about zinc let's talk I, I was i was reading about zinc like you know if you're going to do like a zinc loss and you know to actually like lay on your back and let it just slowly um dissolve uh, i think chris Kress was talking about to get into the into the pharynx and all that um i use zinc do you use zinc as well Yes, yeah, zinc is one of the ones we recommend for people. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And do you find that there's one zinc you like better than another zinc? Because I know there's always a conversation of absorption, um, one zinc better than the other zinc, copper, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I tend to use more of a chelated zinc, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure that that's the right thing. It seems like the right thing. It's, it seems like the right thing. I mean, I take it. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I, mean I, I use it. So far, so good. Fingers crossed, right? Um, you know, and of course, now vitamin SD, vitamin social distance, right? So, that's, right. that's, that's where we're at. Okay. Well, very cool. I thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really enjoyed it. I uh, learned some great tidbits. I hope everybody else did as well. If you can share that link, I'm going to share it with everybody else. And any parting words? No, just everyone stay safe, be healthy, and uh, thank you for tuning in today. 
enjoyed uh, talking with you, Michael, and uh, and to the folks who are listening. So um, let's do this again sometime. Right. Thanks. We will see you soon. Okay. All right. All right. Take care, Michael. See Thank ya. you so much. Thank you.